Please stand as you are able. <clears throat> With faith in Jesus Christ, we receive the body of our sister, Sandra Day O'Connor, for burial. Let us pray with confidence to God, the giver of life, that he will raise her to perfection in the company of the saints. Deliver your servant, Sandra, O Sovereign Lord Christ, from all evil, and set her free from every bond, that she may rest with all your saints in the eternal habitations, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us also pray for all who mourn, that they may cast their care on God and know the consolation of his love. Almighty God, look with pity upon the sorrows of your servants for whom we pray. Remember them, Lord, in mercy. Nourish them in patience. Comfort them with a sense of your goodness. Lift up your countenance upon them and give them peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
I am resurrection and I am life, says the Lord. Whoever has faith in me shall have life even though he die. And everyone who has life and has committed himself to me in faith shall not die forever. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. After my awaking, he will raise me up and in my body I shall see God. I myself shall see in my eyes behold him who is my friend and not a stranger. For none of us has life in himself, and none becomes his own master when he dies. For if we have life, we are alive in the Lord, and if we die, we die in the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's possession. Happy from now on are those who die in the Lord. So it is, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. Good morning, my name is Randy Hollerith. I am the Dean of Washington National Cathedral. And on behalf of Mary Ann Buddy, the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Washington, and all of us at the cathedral, we are honored to hold this service today and we welcome you all to this house of prayer for all people. We say goodbye today to a remarkable human being. Justice O'Connor was a leader, a trailblazer, a model, and a patriot. A devoted member of this cathedral community, she was kind enough to take time out of her busy schedule on the bench to serve two terms, a total of eight years on the chapter, the governing board of this cathedral. Always a person of deep faith, she held firm to the highest ideals of her religion and her country. During the funeral for President Reagan, Justice O'Connor stood right in this spot and read from a 1630 sermon by John Winthrop in which he wrote, Now the only way to provide for our posterity is to follow the counsel of Micah, to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. Sandra Day O'Connor did all three throughout her life and her career and we are a better country because of it. Thank you.
To the O'Connor family, my wife Jill and I send our love on behalf of a truly grateful nation for her service. I'm humbled to be asked to speak today. To the members of the clergy, the Chief Justice, Justice of the Supreme Court, past and present, members of the bench and bar, members of the Congress, distinguished guests, and fellow Americans. More than 40 years ago, on a Wednesday in September 1981, the Senate Judiciary Committee came to order. I was the ranking member of that committee, and the day's business was momentous. The nomination of Sandra Day O'Connor to become the first woman in American history to serve as a Supreme Court Justice on the United States Supreme Court. Announcing her nomination earlier that summer, President Reagan described her as, and I quote, a person for all seasons. And it was a person for all seasons who we saw in that hearing, and the Americans and the world would see through her extraordinary service as a justice and I might add, as a citizen. Gracious and wise, civil and principled, Sandra Day O'Connor, the daughter of the American West, was a pioneer in her own right, breaking down the barriers in legal and political worlds and the nation's consciousness. To her, the Supreme Court was bedrock the bedrock of America. It was the vital, the vital line of defense for the values and the vision of our Republic, devoted not to pursuit of power for power's sake, but to make real the promise of America. The American promise that holds that we're all created equal and deserve to be treated equally throughout our lives. The High Court, she said in her opening statement, and I quote, is a body to which all Americans look for the ultimate protection of their rights. It is the United States Supreme Court that we all turn when we seek that which we want most from our government, equal justice under law, end of quote. Equal justice under law is the, noble, the noblest aspiration of humankind, and the aspiration of Sandra Day O'Connor, one that she pursued her whole life. The last justice to have held elective office, she was especially conscious of the law's real impact on people's lives. One need not agree with all her decisions in order to recognize that her principles were deeply held and of the highest order, and that her desire for civility was genuine, and her trust in the capacity of human institutions to make life better is what this world was abiding. And how she embodied such attributes under such pressure and scrutiny helped empowered generations of women in every part of American life, including the court itself, helping to open doors, secure freedoms, and prove that a woman can not only do anything a man can do, but many times do it a heck of a lot better. Excuse my language, Father. Beyond the bench, Justice O'Connor valued the civic life of the nation, in our schools, in our community centers, in families, and in our friendships. Yes, America is the land of rugged individualists, adventurers, and entrepreneurs. But she knew no person is an island. In the fabric of our nation, we're all inextricably linked. And for the America to thrive, America must see themselves not as enemies, 
but as partners in the great work of deciding our collective destiny. That's the essence of our national experience, the sacred cause of democracy she devoted her life to, one that we must continue. I'll close with how she closed her opening statement on that September day 42 years ago. She spoke about the power of family, family being the hope of the world, the strength of community, the relationship between ourselves and generations as follow. To her sons, Scott, Brian, and Jay, how she admired your intellect, and you may recall that hearing your sense of adventure. <laughs> We all saw on that day and all those years after how much she loved your dad, a brilliant lawyer who always, always supported her. To the entire family, including the grandchildren, I know how hard all these years have been to watch a disease that robbed them both and all of you of so very much. But I hope, I hope you hold on to what is never truly lost, the love both of them had for you, and the love you had for them, a love they shared so freely, and a love you returned with equal devotion. What a gift. What a gift. And I hope you find comfort and another profound consequence of her service, the countless families that she helped by speaking so openly about your family's experiences. It matters. In that opening statement on that day in September, she mentioned how your parents got married in December. Here we gather today, a day before it would have been their 71st wedding anniversary. I know the anniversaries and the birthdays, the moments big and small will be hard without them. But as the saying goes, memory is the power to gather roses in winter. I hope you find the strength in knowing that your mom and dad are together again this December, gathering roses in winter once again as great Americans, both great Americans for all seasons. May God bless Sandra Day O'Connor, an American pioneer.
When Sandra Day O'Connor was a little girl, growing up on the vast and majestic Lazy Bee Ranch, she asked her father, Daddy, why don't we go to church on Sunday? And Mr. Day answered, Well, church is too far, and the preacher's no good. And he said, Church is all around us here. In Washington, Justice O'Connor found her church. On many Sundays, she read scripture in the Bethlehem Chapel here at the National Cathedral. But her temple, you might say, was the white marble building on First Street Northeast. When she got to the Supreme Court in September 1981, she was the first woman justice in our history in 200 years. On TV, millions watched a handsome, self-possessed women with a gap-toothed smile disarmed the senators, all of the male. The vote to confirm her was 99 to nothing. The headline on the cover of Time magazine read, Justice at Last. The law, like much else in our society, had long been dominated by men. Sandra Day graduated near the top of her class at Stanford Law School and was able to get only one, one job interview at a law firm. But not for a lawyer's job. The lawyer interviewing her asked, how well can you type? She was never bitter. 
She went to the local DA's office and asked if she could work there. I have no money to pay you, the DA said. I'll work for free. I don't have any space for you. I can sit with your secretary. He hired her and eventually even paid her. And so on she went, never looking back, never looking down. Returning to Arizona, she was elected the first woman majority leader of a state senate anywhere in the United States. Not all the men were glad to see her. I asked a longtime Senate staffer how she did it. He answered, she was smart. She was also brave. And importantly, she knew how to listen. When Sandra Day O'Connor arrived at the US Supreme Court, she found the place to be cold, and not just because she missed the Arizona sun. At the court's weekly lunches, only about half the justices showed up. So she made it her business to make the justices come to lunch, not to talk about cases or argue over the law, but to get to know each other. If they didn't go to lunch, she would go to their chambers and just sit there until they did. When Justice Clarence Thomas came on the court, he later told me, he didn't much feel like going to lunch. But after conference, Justice O'Connor would walk with him down the hallway saying, Clarence, you need to come to lunch. So finally, as he told me, I started going to lunch. He felt he belonged. He said, she was the glue. The reason this place was civil was Sandra Day O'Connor. Justice O'Connor, who had rounded up cattle as a teenage girl, expected you to do your job thoroughly and without complaint. One of her law clerks taped on the wall a photocopy of Justice O'Connor's hand with this message. If you want a pat on the back, lean here. She was tough, and she could be, as she called herself, bossy. Every year, she marched her clerks off to look at the cherry blossoms, even when it was 40 degrees and raining. She took them on fishing trips, and when she caught a really big one, she would yell, hot diggity dog. She was actually modeling a balanced life, recalled one of her clerks. Make time for your family. Take care of yourself. Get exercise and experience the outdoors. Have a sense of the wider culture. The clerk said, we were getting not just an apprenticeship in law, but in life. She was never small-minded. The justices can be critical of each other and their opinions. She didn't do that. When one of her clerks included a sharp rejoinder in the draft opinion, she looked up and said, a little snippy, aren't we? And crossed it out. She knew how to be selfless. In 1996, in United States versus Virginia, the court ruled that state schools could not exclude women from admission. It was a landmark case in women's rights. Justice Stevens, who was the senior justice in the majority, assigned the court's opinion to Justice O'Connor as the court's first woman and for 12 years, the only woman on the court. She said no. This should be Ruth's case, she said, turning to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Justice Ginsburg later told me, I loved her for that. In 24 years, Justice O'Connor cast a decisive vote in some 330 cases. That's a lot of power. Some pundits began writing about the O'Connor court. But that's not the way she looked at it. She did not like being called the swing vote. She would say, that sounds fickle. Rather, she came to view the court as not the all-powerful last word, but as an institution that is engaged in an ongoing conversation with other branches of government, legislators, executives, federal, state, local. She had an uncanny feel for where the country was on difficult issues like abortion rights, affirmative action, and religious freedom. She knew that when progress comes, it should be careful, thoughtful, considered, she knew this from her own experience. 
It's good to be first, she told her clerks, but you don't want to be the last. How happy she was to see four women justices on the court. She also told her clerks, never be above taking care of people. In 2005, at the height of her power, she decided to leave the court to take care of her beloved husband, John, who had Alzheimer's. She explained, he sacrificed his career for me. Now, she said, it's my turn to sacrifice for him. She was devoted to the rule of law, and she was relentless about spreading the word, traveling all over the globe to do it. After she left the court, she made a crusade of teaching civics to school kids. The program she created, iCivics, now reaches middle schoolers by the millions. Civics, civility, the rule of law. She had a kind of civic religion, not just the law that is written down, but the unwritten rules of fairness and decency in the way we should treat each other everywhere and always. How lucky we were that she was the first. How much we miss her. It has been said that the Supreme Court is like a family, a family composed entirely of in-laws. <laughs> Forty-two years ago, I was assigned to help then-Judge O'Connor join that family. It was my first day in a new job at the Justice Department, and I was proud to be part of her team. I thought our group did a pretty good job. After all, the justice was confirmed 99 to nothing, and we must have had something to do with that. <clears throat> only, <clears throat> only many years later was I told that she thought I had been slow in getting material to her. <laughs> I should have learned that when she had a challenge or responsibility before her, her approach was simple and direct. Get it done. The way she participated in oral argument at the court is a good example. Now, justices have many different styles on the bench. Some like the back and forth of debates. Others pose unusual hypotheticals. Some badger counsel to get concessions. Others spell out a particular theory at length and ask for comment. Now, all this is fine and good, but Justice O'Connor was different. After the advocate had gotten through only a couple sentences, the justice would jump in before her colleagues could with a well-prepared question. The question was clear, direct, even enunciated carefully. It went to the heart of the lawyer's case with no fluff. Her approach was, let's get, get what's most important to me on the table at the outset, get it done. 
Another example came the day I was nominated to succeed Justice O'Connor. Reporters had asked her what she thought of the nomination. She had nice things to say, but ended by noting that the only problem was I didn't wear a skirt. My initial reaction was, of course, everything's negotiable. <laughs> but fortunately, it didn't come to that. She called me later that day and said there's something very important that I had to do right away. My ears perked up. She said, you have to hire by incoming law clerks or they won't have jobs. My ears unperked. But she saw a problem for the clerks and a solution, and she wanted to get it done so they could rest easy. She seemed a bit put out when I said I probably would wait until I was confirmed to do anything on the subject. Now, Justice O'Connor had set her actual departure date from the court to coincide with the day her successor was confirmed. But a second vacancy on the court and associated delays led to her and I sitting together for more than half of the next term. That was enough time for another lesson. She and I were discussing a case in chambers, and I think she grew tired of my on the one hand and on the other hand. She simply got up and said, you just have to decide. There was impatience in her voice, but I don't think it was entirely due to me. She had made her own decision about the future and announced her retirement six months earlier. I think she was anxious to get it done. The last several weeks after Justice O'Connor's passing, I have spoken with many women judges and lawyers who were young adults when Justice O'Connor became the first. They say the same thing. Younger people today cannot understand what it was like before Justice O'Connor in what now seems a distant past. That distance is a measure of time, but is also a measure of Justice O'Connor's life and work. In nearly a quarter century on the court, she was a strong, influential, and iconic jurist. Her leadership shaped the legal profession making it obvious that judges are both women and men. The time when women were not on the bench seemed so far away because Justice O'Connor was so good when she was on the bench. She was so successful that the barriers she broke down are almost unthinkable today, but not so in her lifetime. Sandra Day O'Connor had to study and launch a career in the law when most when men in the established profession did not want women lawyers, let alone judges. She had to find her own style to cajole, persuade, and unite colleagues when there was no example to follow for the first female Senate leader in the country. She had to ignore slights and work to bring people together in social, professional, and political life. She had to, to demonstrate excellence as the 102nd member of the Supreme Court, all the while setting a model as the first woman on the job. She had to fight cancer and Alzheimer's in public ways that helped others and that promoted dignity and respect. She had to speak and teach and inspire through the country and around the world about the necessity of judicial independence so our generation and the next would have a roadmap to safeguard it with all the gifts God has given us. She had to be both the most important woman in government and also a devoted wife who, with her devoted husband, John, raised three sons of whom they were so very proud. All this and more she had to do, and she got it done.
I'm Jay O'Connor, the youngest son of Sandra Day O'Connor. Normally my voice isn't quite this raspy or alluring. After a very sore throat last night, I woke up and was hardly able to speak, so I'll do my best. Mr. President, Chief Justice Roberts, and Evan Thomas, the entire O'Connor family is truly, truly honored and grateful for your generous words about our mother. We gladly shared our mother with the nation for 40 years. So imagine what it means to her sons and grandsons to hear the tributes that you've given here today and the outpouring of public admiration she has received since her death. Thank you. I would like to share with you all a, a son's personal portrait of the human side of our mother, focusing on what she loved, what she believed, and what she was like, especially as a mom. I should note that I've asked the choir to break into a lively song if the, my emotions get the better of me. Her first love was the Lazy Bee Ranch in Arizona where she was raised, a place where she could look out across the rugged high desert, unobstructed by trees, and she could see forever. She loved books. Growing up with the Lazy Bee and living 30 miles from town was an isolating experience. Books transported her to another place as a young girl and ultimately led her to Stanford and beyond. She loved the law and the Supreme Court. She loved our country and our democracy. And most of all, she loved her family. From her father, she learned toughness. From her mother, she learned how to handle any situation with grace. Her relationship with her husband, our dad, John O'Connor, was one for the ages. They were the ultimate supporters and fans of one another in a marriage that lasted 57 years. Despite our colorful flaws, she loved her three sons, and she adored her daughters-in-law and the grandchildren that followed. At age, in 19, uh, 2006, at age 76, she stepped down for the Supreme Court. Obviously, after her long, incredible career, it was time to kick back, play golf, and drink margaritas, right? Not for Sandra Day O'Connor. She saw a big problem looming in the country, and she decided to do something about it. She'd become concerned that citizens were increasingly disengaged from their democracy. She looked to the future, and she saw so clearly, decades before anyone else, that our democracy could not be taken for granted. She could not have been more prescient. So she started a nonprofit called iCivics, you've heard about today already, in, designed to teach young people how our government and how our democracy work in a way that's really fun and engaging, using online, interactive, role-based games and great content, all for free. The concept took off. Today, iCivics is used by half of all middle school and, call and high school kids in this country and over half the schools. To you business types, let me put her iCivics accomplishment in another way. At the age of 78, our mom founded and led a hot tech-based nonprofit startup. Within 10 years, she had achieved over 85% market share and 50% market penetration. Not too shabby. Church is a place for confession, and I feel the need to come clean today on a family secret we've protected for decades related to this very topic. Years ago, while going through my mom's papers, I came across a box containing her report cards from middle school and high school. Of course, her marks were sterling until I was shocked to see something, a B a scarlet bee. In, in the first semester of one, a trimester of one of her classes, and imagine what class it was in, civics. Sandra Day O'Connor once got a B in civics. In the presence of the president, 
the Supreme Court justices, and all of you today, I ask you this. Based on her 40-year dedication to promoting the rule of law and democracy in home and, uh, home and abroad, do you think she has earned enough extra credit to raise that lowly B in civics to an A? Okay. What was she like? Quite simply, she was a force of nature. When she walked into a room, everything was more vivid. She willed things into action. People had a very hard time saying no to her, except her three sons and some of her lively colleagues on the Supreme Court. She had unearthly energy, as one of her law clerks said of her. Her way of relaxing after a long workday was to play three sets of tennis or 18 holes of golf. As we heard, she would often drag her clerks out on big outings or hikes each year, rain or shine. She brainwashed us as kids to think our turbocharged level of family activities was normal. <laughs> Did we really need to go to a three family parties and a square dance, yes, a square dance, all in one night? It was not normal. She drew people in, took an interest in them, and made them feel special. Evan Thomas said a few minutes ago, she could be known as bossy. Well, her family can agree there's a lot of truth to that. But Evan, don't forget, she was the boss, the lady boss. She had fun. Mom and dad absolutely loved to dance, and they were known as the best dancers in Washington. In this city, it was not uncommon for the dance floor to clear the moment they stepped onto it hand in hand. They were that good. In the late 70s in Arizona, they actually took lessons in disco dancing. <laughs> Quick survey of the justices of the Supreme Court here with us today. Raise your hand if you have received technical training in disco dancing. That's what I thought. My mom is the first person on the Supreme Court with technical training in disco dancing. All right, what was she like as a mom? While having a very demanding full-time professional career, she was still a mom in every sense of the word. She ran absolutely everything in her home. She did it all, organizing the household, outstanding cooking, grocery shopping, getting the kids where we needed to be, planning our social calendars, taking care of her mother-in-law, everything. All while still achieving ordinary things, uh, extraordinary things at work. My brothers and I all had a front row seat and we still wonder how she did it all. She loved her own marriage, so of course she wanted to set up her three sons with nice young women too. My brothers and I all thought our dating lives were going great. But to our mom, we weren't married yet, so it was DEF CON 3. Once in my early 30s, she tried to set me up with a new prospect. She said, now Jay, I want you to meet a delightful young woman who's the daughter of somebody I know. She's very nice. There's just one thing. Recently, she fell off a horse and she's in a full body cast right now, but I'm sure her cast will be off in no time. That was the low point of my dating life. <laughs> my mom trying to set me up with a woman in a full body cast. But in her mind, this was a pragmatic solution to the problem of a son she loved without a nice wife. Classic Sandra Day O'Connor. When some years later I met and married my amazing and beautiful wife, Heather, it was unclear who loved Heather even more, my mom or me. I say it was me, but it was close. She varied her approaches with each of her sons based on her different interests and personalities. With her hard-charging eldest son, Scott, getting to him to 5.30 a.m. swim practice each morning helped him be, to become an all-American swimmer at Stanford. 
With her thrill-seeking middle son, Brian, it was a different story and a different approach. When Brian was in high school, he decided to secretly take hang gliding lessons. He knew her parents would not be thrilled. When my mother, my mother discovered a receipt Brian had accidentally dropped on the bedroom floor, smooth move, Brian, there was quite a discussion that night at the dinner table. Our parents said to Brian, hang gliding is literally the most dangerous sport in the world. We give you boys a lot of latitude, but we draw the line at hang gliding for all we care you could take up parachuting. So naturally, the next weekend, Brian took up parachuting. And now, 2,500 jumps later, he's an elite level parachutes and he still does 50 man formations. As for approach with me, one important mention was that my mom typed all my papers in high school until I took typing class in junior year of high school. Let me tell you, nothing quite focuses the mind like having Sandra Day O'Connor type and read all your English essays. To her tremendous credit, she never took out her red editing pen on my papers. She typed them exactly as written. It must have been torture for her. <laughs> I can assure you that her law clerks did not enjoy the same special treatment. We had lots of interesting conversations around the dinner table. And of course, my mom asked probing questions. On the court, as Chief Justice Roberts just explained, she was known for almost asking, always asking the first questions at oral arguments, searing questions that cut to the heart of the case. Where do you think she developed those world-class interrogation skills? Once she arrived at the Supreme Court, hardly. She finally honed those techniques from years of grilling her three sons about what time we had come home on Saturday night. To the trial attorneys of America, you're welcome. What were our mom's maxims for us as kids? The sayings that she drilled into us over and over again. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all. Get it done. Does that sound familiar, Chief? And her most repeated command of all, don't hit your brother. And amazingly, these very maxims were some of the exact same strategies she used to make herself so successful in life and on the Supreme Court. I'm serious. Don't hit your brother was the first lesson in her own philosophy that she taught us over time, to not lash out at anyone, even your opponent, and to treat everyone with kindness and respect. This approach allowed her to navigate every situation with grace and goodwill. In 1987, 36 years ago, she wrote out by longhand a letter to her three sons and sealed it, not to be opened until near the end of her life. Included were detailed instructions about what should happen when she died. This included what she wanted at her funeral, her favorite music to include, some key readings, and more. The unmistakable theme of her selections was justice on earth. How fitting. It won't surprise you to know that we are following her instructions here today to a T. And in the letter, she also wrote her final message to her sons. This included the following passage. Our purpose in life is to help others along the way. May you each try to do the same. Our purpose in life is to help others along the way. What a beautiful, powerful, and totally Sandra Day O'Connor sentiment. And it is so clear to Scott, Brian, and me that she lived her own life in complete accord with this purpose. So now that she has completed the circle, her family will take her remains back to her beloved Lazy Bee Ranch, back to Round Mountain, where she can hear the two giant windmills spin and creak in the wind, and where she learned how to see forever across the high, open desert. 
back to the sacred place where her extraordinary life began. What do we say to this special person, this little cowgirl, this remarkable woman from a remote cattle ranch in Arizona, this mother, this justice, who did so much for so many people? We say to her, we thank you. We love you. We will never, ever forget you. of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God.
Please stand as you are able. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God of grace and glory, we, remem we remember before you this day our sister Sandra. We thank you for giving her to us, her family and friends, to know and to love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see in death the gate of eternal life, so that in quiet confidence we may continue our course on earth until by your call we are reunited with those who have gone before. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Most merciful God, whose wisdom is beyond our understanding. Deal graciously with Sandra's family and friends in their grief. 
Surround them with your love, that they may not be overwhelmed by their loss, but have confidence in your goodness and strength to meet the days to come. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. A reading from the prophet Micah. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? The word of the Lord. Psalm 106, hallelujah, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Who can declare the mighty acts of the Lord, 
or show forth all his praise. Happy are those who act with justice and always do what is right. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor you have for your people and visit me with your saving help that I may see the prosperity of your elect and be glad with the gladness of your people and that I may glory with your inheritance.
the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. In the name of God, amen. Please be seated. My name is Bishop Marianne Buddy, and on behalf of all of us gathered here, heartfelt thanks to Justice O'Connor's family for the gift of gathering us in remembrance and thanksgiving for one you loved so well and by whom you were deeply loved. Thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Chief Justice, for your tributes, for Mr. Thomas, not only for your words here, but your insightful biography of Justice O'Connor and to you, Mr. O'Connor, for speaking so vividly and poignantly about your mother. To the readers and musicians, those offering prayers, what a holy moment this is, and we are blessed to be a part of it. When someone so loved and admired and from whom we have learned so much dies, we, we face the reality of death. So let me say this. Having lived my vocation for over 30 years, having been at the bedside of many who have breathed their last, I am persuaded that God's mercy and love meet us when we cross over from this life to whatever awaits us beyond it. I can't say much more about the mysteries of death, but about God's love, I am sure. And in that confidence, I speak to you today. And isn't it also true, at the threshold of death, we can't help but ponder the mystery of life, and not life in the abstract, but the one wild and precious life that was Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. One of my teachers liked to remind us that what we say, what any of us say about anyone else, reveals as much about us as the one whom we, of whom we speak. And that was certainly the case in the year 2008, when Justice O'Connor returned to her beloved alma mater to deliver the inaugural speech for what would become an annual event 
honoring the renowned Stanford Law professor, Harry Rathbun, who had inspired her to study law. And as with your tributes to Justice O'Connor today, what she said about Professor Rathburn offered insight into her soul and her sense of vocation. Rathburn, she said, was the first person ever to speak in my presence of how an individual can make a difference, how a single caring person can effectively determine the course of events. I had not heard that before, really. And he put it in such a persuasive way that I think most of us came to believe it might be true and to take seriously the notion that we could make a difference. Few people have taken as seriously as she the conviction that a single caring person can help de determine the course of events. But as evidence today, and in the scores of remembrances since her death, she not only lived by that conviction, she inspired it in others. She cared deeply for those in her orbit, and she invested in them the way Rathburn had invested in her. Now, in that same speech, she quoted a poem by Rudyard Kipling that Rathburn often cited. And in it, we can hear the life philosophy that guided her in, in the courtroom and in life. They're good words for us all. If, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when others doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too, if you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet don't look too good, nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools, if you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings nor lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all count with you but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of a distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And what's more, you'll be a man, my son. Justice O'Connor had no interest in being a man. But she didn't feel herself excluded from Kipling's wisdom, and she resolved to live by it. And doing so, she walked through doors previously reserved for men and kept them open for those of us who followed. Preparation for today, I've found myself pondering the arc of long lives, the evolution and transformation of life that occurs over decades and the essence of a person that remains constant over time. For we pay homage to the entirety of Justice O'Connor's life from her childhood at the Lazy Bee and her final years as she succumbed to the same disease that afflicted her husband, John. And few of us know, actually, what it cost Justice Sandra Day O'Connor to live her life in her seasons of greatest strength and joy, she seemed invincible, the most powerful woman in Washington. Yet we know that the arc of any life is never a straight line, and hers was no exception. As the Franciscan theologian Richard Rohr writes, life, as the biblical tradition makes clear, 
is both loss and renewal, death and resurrection, chaos and the healing of it at the same time. Life can seem to be a collision of opposites. Faith at its core is an abiding trust in an underlying life force so strong that it includes even death. Another woman pioneer of the law, Polly Murray, was born 20 years before Justice O'Connor on the other side of the country and on the other side of the racial divide. Well acquainted with racial discrimination, Murray was stunned to discover when she enrolled at Howard University Law School that gender discrimination was as large, if not a larger hurdle for her than race. And she dedicated her life to ending what she dubbed as Jane Crow. And Murray lived to see Justice O'Connor named to the highest court in the land. And shortly before her death in 1985, Murray said, I've lived long enough to see many of my lost causes found. You see, Justice O'Connor wasn't only an inspiration for those who came after her, she was the realization of what generations of women before her struggled in their respective realms to accomplish. And there's a particular responsibility that comes with being first, not just to the future, but to the past. And she held that space with such grace and dignity, recognizing the power and the importance of standing in that gap between dreams denied and dreams realized. And she also lived long enough to see some of her influence wane. And she had to make her peace with that too, which is not easy. And when she recited Kipling's words at Stanford in 2008, I wonder if those realities were as much in her mind as the challenges of her more active years. But what all of us in this cathedral over the age of 60 know, and some learn it earlier, is that such losses are universal. We live and we work and we strive to make our contributions and we simply do not know which of our accomplishments, if any, will endure. Some will, others will not. The pendulum of humanity swings in ways we cannot predict or control. And so we occupy our time, our place in time, and in the ebb and flow of humanity's story, doing all that we can while we can until the time comes when we must let go all at once or in stages. And there is nothing more difficult than letting go. But that, too, is a part of the mystery of life, what it means to be human. All the more poignant for those like Justice O'Connor and so many of you gathered to honor her, whose vocations are played out in the most influential of arenas. So I leave you with words of one who also knew the gift and the cost of a long life dedicated to public service. The 20th, century, the 20th century theologian, Reinhold Niebuhr. And he said this, there's nothing worth doing that can be accomplished in our lifetime. Therefore, we must be saved by hope. Nothing which is true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. Therefore, we must be saved by faith. Nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. Therefore, we must be saved by love. And no virtuous act is quite as virtuous from the standpoint of our friend or foe as it is from our standpoint. Therefore, we must be saved by the final form of love, which is forgiveness. As we commend to God, 
the wild and precious life of Justice Sandra Ray O'Connor and entrust to her, to that God of faith, hope, love, and forgiveness, may you live by the same, the same hope, the same faith, the same love, the same forgiveness now in the wild and precious life that is yours and in the service that is still yours to give. Please stand as you were able.
In the assurance of eternal life given at baptism, let us proclaim our faith and say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. For our sister Sandra, let us pray to the Lord Jesus Christ who said, I am resurrection and I am life. Lord, you consoled Martha and Mary in their distress. Draw near to us who mourn for Sandra and dry the tears of those who weep. You wept at the grave of Lazarus, your friend. Comfort us in our sorrow. You raised the dead to life. Give our sister Sandra eternal life. You promised paradise to the thief who repented. Bring our sister to the joys of heaven. Our sister was washed in baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit. Give her, O oh Lord, fellowship with all your saints. She was nurtured with your body and blood. Grant her a place at the table in your heavenly kingdom. And now comfort us in our sorrows at the death of our sister. Let our faith be our consolation and eternal life our hope. Hear us, Lord. Father of all, we pray to you for Sandra and for all those whom we love but see no longer. Grant to them eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. May her soul and the souls of all the departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace.
shall serve, and the dead shall be raised, and the dead shall be raised in corruptible. The trumpet shall sound. He raised in corruptible, and we shall be changed, and we shall be changed. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints. For sorrow and pain are no more, neither sighing, but life everlasting. You only are immortal, the creator and maker of mankind. And we are mortal, formed of the earth. And to earth shall we return. For so did you ordain when you created me, saying, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust, yet even at the grave we make our song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Give rest, O Christ, Christ, to thy servant with thy saints. Where sorrow and pain are no neither sighing, but life everlasting.
Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Sandra. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. See. 